for people huh? drifting in as the afternoon goes, especially if they try, like we did, to come in through the, the event preparations <laughs> in the lawn, uh, which will reroute you unless you give money. <laughs> if you give money, they'll let you through straight away. You know, but otherwise, you have to walk around. It's part of the new strategy. Uh, but I'd like to welcome you to another of the East Asia Center sponsored events of the of fall semester. And uh, there's a, quite a diversity of events that are planned. And uh, this is a special kind of diversity because our speaker, uh, Josh Eisenman, gave a talk yesterday on China and Africa. Uh, and based on his uh, multiple trips there and based on the book that he's writing with in uh, collaboration with Ambassador David Shen, who is our ambassador to several African countries, and this will be the second book that they've co authored. So, the talk yesterday is China and Africa. So, what do you expect the talk today to be on? China and the Middle East, China and South America, <laughs> China and Southeast Asia? No, it's about the communists. It's about China's political economic development and the mentality of China's political economic development. Uh, in the uh, pre-reform era, and this is an era that is neglected not just in uh, the United States or among Westerners, you think that China was created <coughs> maybe by Christopher Columbus, depending on which high school. Anyway, uh, uh, in uh, 1978 or 80 or something like that and with the reform era and before then, China was uh, to misuse Mao Zedong's phrase, poor and black. Uh, and in fact, what happened in China from 1949 to 1970, uh, we know the disastrous low points of that period better than we know the overall development and especially the previous, the 10 years previous to the reform era. And of that, uh, we know slightly more maybe about the cities uh, due to works, classic works like Ezra Vogel's uh, Canton Under Communist Rule than we know about what was going on in the countryside. Uh, and so this is an area which cries out for further research and further evaluation. And I'm happy to say that our speaker today, Josh Eisenman, heard the cry and has really done a marvelous job of, in, of researching what the actual process of rural development was in China, especially in the post, in the 1969 to 1979 period, and what progress had been made, why that progress was made, and how substantial that progress was made how substantial that progress was. And overall, if I can, I don't want to take any surprise conclusions from you, but overall, he thinks that China was in a situation in 1979 that rather than being desperate and needing some total overhaul, uh, uh, could have made further progress as it was. Okay. And, uh, that's going to be, that's a, a hard argument to make, but it's an argument that uh, uh, Professor Eisenman makes with data. And with a, not just data, uh, you know, from the, the statistical abstracts, because that's not so particularly, the further back you go in China, the less reliable, the more guesstimate there is in that overall data. But from actually going to places, talking to people, lots of interviews with people behind this book. For those of you who go to China and talk to a variety of people over the last 30 years, it'll help solve an anomaly that you talk to rural people in China, often they'll say, oh, life was better in the Mao years, you know, and uh, the current situation is reformed, Deng Xiaoping, that. Well, you don't often hear Deng Xiaoping, that, in the U.S., and you don't often hear it officially in China, but you can hear it in rural areas Professor Eisenman is Associate Professor at the Institute for Global Studies, Activities, 
Oh, <laughs> bears. <laughs> Also, a, a professor in the, the uh, political science department at Notre Dame. He moved there from uh, his uh, time at the LBJ school. He goes to China very, very frequently. His Chinese is fluent enough so that he's given this talk in China in Chinese. Uh, and, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing his remarks and being enlightened about a period that most of us would consider unenlightened. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate it. Uh, well, this, this is great. And you know, I should start by saying, as Brantley did, that this is the presentation that I gave in Chinese in China at several agricultural universities recently. Unedited, unabridged, exactly the same. So what's interesting is, while Xi Jinping has made it much harder to discuss many issues, the Qian San Shinian, as it's known, the first 30 years, is actually a topic that can be discussed now in ways that it could not have been discussed when I actually did this research. This might be an irony, I think, of the Xi era, that this topic is actually something that there is more space on than there was when I actually did the research on the topic. So worth mentioning this transition, because we often hear about the Xi Jinping era being a time of closing down. But on this one unique area, there is actually more room to come. Go figure. So um, I just want to show you guys the images that you have here. Kind of, why did I put these up? Well, this is the propaganda version of the commune, the Hongqi commune. This is what the imagination of the commune is. And for those of you who've studied economics, you might notice that it is very different than what we think of when we think of specialization, right? Now in China, we've got Thai city, we've got underwear city, we've got sock city, right? We have a specialization, just like Ricardo told us to do, in his, in, in, and, and just like all the neoclassical economics says we should do. That is not what's going on here, right? What's going on here is a uh, many things going on in one locality, right? It is a synergizing of numerous things simultaneously, such that here you have the, the Ming Bing, the people's militia, here you have people threshing wheat, here they're growing something else, here they may be smelting steel, here they're practicing the Arhu, here the kids are going to school. So the, the conception of the people's commune was something which was Dofang. It had many different aspects inside of one place. And one reason that they did that was because China is a big country. And so while neoclassical economics, how much, what does neoclassical economics say about transportation costs within a country? They're zero. Is that true? No, especially in China, especially in the 1950s and 60s. So the desire to create this is in part a response to the size of the country, that you couldn't create a sock city or a focused kind of development at that time because you lacked the network of transportation necessary. So this is not something that you're gonna read about in your economic textbooks. Now how close was it to reality? This here is the only image I've ever seen of an actual commune. This is a picture taken from a hot air balloon by an American and an Italian in 1983 in Heilongjiang province. Do, it's really funny, the book is called Over China, and it's a picture book of these guys floating over China, a hot air balloon. Do not try this today, I don't think the PLA will let you do it, <laughs> but uh, suffice it to say the first people thanked in the book are the PLA, People's Liberation Army. But you can see that there are some similarities here, right? You have the high modernist uh, development, you know, straight roads, these kind of squared off images, and you also see similarities here in terms of you've got many different aspects of development within one particular unit or subunit. At the same time, you can see that everybody seems to have what's called the ziliodi or the sideline plot areas. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's important to understand that this is only one particular subunit of one particular commune. It may not represent everything everywhere, but that there is some thing between what was imagined and what was actually created. There is a relationship here, and that is not the relationship that neoclassical economics would have predicted. So I wanna, first let me talk to you what I'm gonna talk about. First, I'm gonna introduce this thing. What is the Chinese commune? What is it? I think most people, even in China, don't really know exactly what it is. Then I'm gonna ask the all important question. Was it productive? And why do I ask that question? Because what we are told is that the commune failed because it was not productive, right? That's the story that Deng Xiaoping told. This was a failed system, so we got rid of it. And that was the story I was told when I first went looking for the commune uh, and, it's, and, and, and to understand why people abrogated the commune when I went to China in the year 2000. 
I was told by numerous people we gave it up because the thing didn't work. So I think we need to explore that. And then, just to tip my hand a bit, why was it productive? So let's move forward then. So what was the commune? Well, first, many people think of the commune with regard to its first two years. That is, the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward was a terrible time. 20 million people starved to death. I mean, there's no getting around it. But the fact is that this was an institution that existed for 25 years. And as anybody who's been a part of or understands anything about institutions, institutions evolve and they change. And this one was no different. It evolved and it changed over time. Now, the initial uh, institution, the Great Leap Forward Commune, was undoubtedly a failure. And therefore, it was reformed. But it's important that we do not allow our understanding of the Great Leap Forward Commune to color our understanding of the 25 years of the institution. Second, it is an economic, here you can see, economic, political, and military institution. And that's very different than what we have in America and even China today. Institutions tend to be of one ilk. This is an educational institution. But under the commune, the commune leadership had under their control economics, politics, and military, and could synergize and use that almost at will. Now, you couldn't give up Maoism and say, you know, forget about that. But you did have the ability to use these things, and they were interconnected in important ways that I'll discuss. And this institution was massive. You really cannot get your head around it. It took me a long time to understand how big this thing really was. Over 80% of all Chinese at the time lived in this institution. About one out of every five people on the earth was a member of the Chinese People's Commune. So this is an inherently big story. It affected generations. And it's important to understanding where China was and how it got to where it is today. It's also important to think about the structure of rural China at this time. And this is the basic structure that you have. The commune, as it is known, is actually a combination of three levels. The commune level, the brigade, or the da, da dui, and the shao dui, or the team. And here you can get a sense of the averages. Your average commune had about 14,000 members about 12 brigades per commune, about 90, team, uh, 90 uh, 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 teams per commune, and about 3,000 households per commune. Now, of course, the only naturally occurring element here is the household. All of the rest of it is administrative levels. So when you think of what does, uh, what does reform and opening up mean in an administrative way, it means you get rid of these three levels. You just you get rid of them. And you create or recreate the township level. Um, so, so what reform and opening up is, from an administrative point, is simply removing this. So was the commune productive? And the conventional view is no. And the revisionist view, or alternative view, is yes, it was. And I want to explore what these views are, because rarely in academia do we have such juxtaposition of uh, views. Usually things are all gradations. But here people feel very strongly. Here's one of the people who feel very strongly, Kei Xiao Zhou. I'm a professor, and she notes that farmers were left with little or no incentive to increase or maintain collective productivity. Cadres organized farming on the commune regardless of the implications for productivity, and they gave farmers no individual incentive to work hard or increase productivity. This same view is put forward by Fairbank and Goldman, two eminent professors of the field, and they note that in the 1970s, the Cultural Revolution spread its coercion into the countryside, where, for example, peasants were required to abandon all sideline occupations, such as raising pigs, chickens, ducks, in order to, quote, cut off the tail of capitalism. For many, this meant starvation. And I want you to keep that word in your mind, starvation, right? Because that is a really strong word to use. This is my own professor at Johns Hopkins, Tan Thurston, who also notes that one of the great mysteries of rural China during the Mao era is why the peasants did not rebel, but the answer seems obvious. Starving people do not rebel. The extent they move at all is to search for food. So this idea then is of these people who are so hungry, so starving, so dilapidated, that they're simply scrounging for food. And this is the idea of the Great Leap Forward Commune, because that's what actually happened during the Great Leap Forward. But there's another idea here, and it's mostly put forward by agricultural economists and people who actually study economics. Because the other folks are mostly political scientists and historians, and I can diss them because I'm a political scientist too. <laughs> So here we have Chris Brommel at SOAS, and he says that the conventional wisdom ignores the evidence pointing to a trend of acceleration in the growth of agricultural production in the 1970s, driven by the trinity of irrigation, fertilizer, and high yield crop varieties. Mao's attempts to expand irrigation were very real, brought lasting benefits. All of this distinguishes Maoism from the strategies adopted across the developing world. 
And here we have Lewis Putterman, another economist, who notes, and compare this to what Ann Thurston said here, right? The commune system played a major role in the delivery of health care, the distribution of basic foodstuffs and population, none of whom, despite their massive pressure on a meager base of land, suffered the landlessness and associated deprivation faced by tens of millions of rural dwellers in China's otherwise Asian neighbors. So, were these people starving, or as Putterman says, did none of them actually suffer landlessness and deprivation? You cannot be both deprived and undeprived. This is pretty binary. So this, this creates a question, a puzzle for us to look at. Which story is true? These are all eminent professors. They're all big names in the field. One of them, one side of this has to be more wrong than the other. And so what I did was I set out to just look at this question. And I learned at GW, at Johns Hopkins, and at UCLA, the first story. I learned from Anne Thurston the first story. I had never heard that there was even another story to know. So when I set off to look at this question, I wanted to understand what nobody had ever been able to explain to me, which is where is the data? Where's the data to explain which story is right or wrong? Was this thing productive or was it not? Presumably this is something we should be able to study. But the problem is we've got a massive data shortage. We have aggregate data on the national level and we have no provincial data at all, zero zilch. So how do we really look at this then? We've got people who have looked at very small localities and they can tell you about the county, a particular county, and we've got people at the high level. But what we didn't, what we lacked, was an understanding of what was going on from the middle level. So what I sought to do was to go to China and do what everybody told me I couldn't do, which was go from agricultural university to agricultural university and speak to people who study fertilizer and seed varieties and people who actually know something about the agricultural development in the area that they study. Not to go to Beijing and listen to the words of those people who have political access to crime, but talk to people who actually understand fertilizer development and seed varieties. And that's what I did. I went to 12 different Chinese agricultural universities all over the country, and I spoke to people who study all of these issues. And then I pulled what I call the Columbo. I said, oh, just one more thing, madam. Uh, do you happen to have any data? And then they would, and they did let me in and allow me to look at their data. And so I got the ideas, and I got the data, and then after I was done with that, I went down and spoke to people who actually lived in the commune. Right, so this was an attempt to triangulate, to see if I could find out from these three sources consistencies in the story to understand what was true and what was not. Now you have to understand here, in every image you see me having a person next to me. That's because these people don't speak Mandarin. They're peasants in the Chinese countryside. They all speak different dialects. But one thing, and I can talk about this because it's very interesting and important, but I don't want to dwell on it, is I was unprepared for the emotions that I was going and the reason this woman is not looking at the camera is because she's bald. Every one of the people I talked to got very emotional, but they did not get emotional because they said, oh, this was a terrible time in my life and it was hideous. They got emotional because they said, and nobody cares about what we did. We broke our ass, we built this irrigation dish, we did this, we did that, and nobody knows what we did, nobody cares. We are not Gai Gai Kai Fang, so we've been excluded from this story. And so the emotion didn't come from, oh, this was so terrible. It came from, finally, someone's here asking me this question, and you're not even Chinese. And that, I think, was uh, something I was completely unprepared for. And we can talk more about these interviews, which are really important to me for a variety of reasons. But let's get to the data already, huh? Eisenman, come on. <laughs> so here is the aggregate data. And I want to stress that this data um, is published in 1983, and I'll talk about in a minute why that's important. But you can see some trends here. First, you can see the great total. It's not hidden, there it is. The fall in agricultural productivity is there for us all to see. We can also see the return to productivity under Deng Xiaoping and Liu Xiaoqi that occurred, and then we can see the results of the uh, Cultural Revolution on productivity, which was a decrease. But then, starting in 1969 to 1979, we have rapid and sustained increases in pig production, and uh, uh, grain production, and later on, when Hua Guofeng decided it was important, edible oils. So you can see this increase. Now what if we look at per unit land? Now every country that develops is taking land out of productive use and making it into an other use. So by definition, during this period, land was falling. So that means this line gets even steeper. China was producing more grain on less land. That's what this shows. And if you look at the provincial level, which is in the book, because the data for every single province that I mentioned that I collected is in the appendix of the book, you'll see this is representative of the trend in general. 
We also know that China's population grew rapidly during this period. So what happens when we divide per capita? Well, it still goes up. Not as fast, but I can tell you that your average worker in 1969 wasn't eating as well as they were in 1979. That we can see from the data. And this is, again, on the aggregate country level, but these trends more or less hold if we go down to the provincial level as well. But can we trust this data? I know you're all thinking that, and I thought it every single day that I was doing this work. Is this data value? Well, there are a few reasons. First, this isn't something I pulled off the internet. I went down into these libraries and got it myself. I own these books. I photocopied them with my own hand. So I can tell you that this is not some contrived data that somebody pulled out of their behind and posted on the internet. <laughs> this is the real deal. These, uh, these books are real. I own them myself. Second, as you saw, the Great Leap Forward is in the data which means they didn't hide it, which means that maybe we can trust the rest of it. Because usually when people cover up blemishes, they usually cover up the biggies. And the biggest blemish is right there. Third, tax evasion. How, raise your hand if you overpaid your taxes. I didn't think so. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> overpays their taxes. <laughs> One kind soul. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. Sure. OK. <laughs> I'll, be check, I'll be checking on you all. Uh, but the point is that when you look at and a lot of people, even, even Fairbank and Goldman uh, say this in their book, that a lot of these small teams and big teams, they had two books, one for the members of the team and one to pass up to the higher level. And if we consider this happen on numerous levels, what happens by the time you get to the top? Well, your numbers are off, but they're not off because you over-exaggerated. They're off because you under-counted. So what everyone who's looked at this data shows is that what I'm showing you here is almost certainly an underestimation of total productivity growth. And another reason is because, as you saw from the picture, Chinese people during this period had private plots. Very hard to monitor how much they were producing on those plots. So I would say that what I've presented here is an underestimation. Despite Ann Thurston and others' claims, we have never heard and I have never seen of any reported cases of mass famine after 1961. If anybody has heard of or seen them, I'd ask you to please bring them forward. But we just haven't. That's important, right? Because if these people were starving, there'd be a record of it somewhere. This is the data that the officials had themselves at the time. This is what they gave to themselves. So even if you don't believe the data, I can tell you for sure this was the data people used to make policy. So this was the policymakers' data. This national data was published, as I said, in 1983, after reform and opening. There is no Maoist bias here. There is no desire to make the Mao era look good. In fact, the desire would be to make the Mao era look bad. So the fact is that there is a, uh, uh, no reason to believe that Deng Xiaoping manipulated this to help Mao Zedong. So this is another reason we can be confident. And then if you believe none of what I'm saying to you, just look at this in terms of trends only. Because I don't think this represents every grain of rice ever produced, but I do think it shows the general trends. And this is the proof in the pudding. These are the world development indicators. And what you're looking at here is unprecedented. In, during this period, from 1964 to 1979, your average Chinese lived 20 years longer. They went from 46 average years of age to 66 average years of age. And if anybody ever asks you, what's the difference between Chinese communism and Russian communism, you look at this line and you say, Russian communism led to a reduction in average life expectancy for your average Russian, and Chinese communism led to a giant increase. This is the proof in the pudding, because if you don't have food, you don't live longer. Now, I, I do want to stress that healthcare and the provision of rural healthcare by what's known as barefoot doctors plays a big role in this, especially prenatal healthcare, uh, a big, big deal. But still, if you're born, you've got to eat to survive. I'll, I'll take any challenges on that. So these people survived and they lived longer. And this is ultimately the decision-making arbiter of whether this data is true or not. So the Chinese commune succeeded in increasing food output on the aggregate per unit land and per unit labor, and the Chinese people lived longer for it. Revisionism in the first degree. Now, the second puzzle now. Why? What did they do? How did this work? Because this is, the, this is the nut we're all trying to crack, right? This is development. How did the Chinese pull it off? Well, to do this, we don't want to, well, we, in my book, I use both neoclassical and classical economics. But classical economics is better. And this guy won the Nobel Prize for this theory. So it's a pretty good one. W. Arthur Lewis at Princeton writes, the central problem in the theory of economic development is how an economy with unlimited labor force living just above subsistence 
can cut consumption and save more. We cannot explain any industrial revolution until we explain why savings increase. Savings is the key. If you can't save, you cannot invest. And in a place like China, which is a closed economy, savings plus consumption is what you got. There is no way to borrow. Communes didn't borrow from each other, and they couldn't go to Barclays or whatever and borrow. So this was a pretty clear accounting. You consume or you save. And the question is, how did they save? Because to increase, you have to extract from an already poor population. How do you take from the poor? How do you do that when they're already scraping by? And that was the great challenge, and that was what the commune did. The turning point came, as Harry Harding is not surprised to hear, in 1970, when China hosted its Northern District Agricultural Conference, something I had never heard of before. This was an essential turning point. It was essentially the party bringing all of the county level leaders from all over China to a two month conference, half of it in Dajai and the other half in Beijing, and saying what worked and what didn't work for the last 10 years. What lessons can we learn? And this is what they learned. And this was a paper that I found in my advisor's office after he passed away that Professor Harding wrote in, I think, 1971 for a conference, where he recognized that China's post-1970 agricultural modernization strategy, uh, mo modernization campaign aimed to, quote, mobilize every possible available resource, be it human, monetary, or material, to support super optimal investment. And that is an important phrase. And it, when I read that phrase, I suddenly began to understand. Because the goal here, was never to allow Chinese people to decide themselves how much to save. It was to force them to save more through a variety of different measures that were adopted. Now, we all have some of this going on ourselves, right? Because when we save for our W-2, it's actually taken from our account prior to us, so we don't actually make that decision. And in China, they didn't make that either, but the question was, super optimal investment. <coughs> how do you get to a point where people are living at a point where they're gonna survive, if you starve your workers, they're not very efficient, right? So you need to have them efficient enough to be productive, but still being able to extract something so you can invest. Well, how to do it? How to increase savings? Well, the following year, remuneration reform was put forward, and this was essential to success. There are two types of remuneration in the commune. The first is collective remuneration, work points, gongfen or gongfer, as they're known, and the second was private remuneration, known as sanzi, or the three small freedoms. This has been lost in history, but was essential to the commune and was not illegal. It was protected under law in China, and I'm gonna explain why and what it was. So what was, first, the work point remuneration system? What did it do? Well, it was a scheme for distracting household attention from the extraction of their income. It was essentially coerced or forced savings. It was a cure for the collective action problems faced by communes everywhere. So the attributes of the system were, first, it was local. In order to make gong fur, you had to work locally, you had to be remunerated locally, and you had to earn locally. If you worked here and then you moved there, you could not collect there. You needed to remain where you were. So it was closely tied to what is known as the hukou system, or the residency permit system. So this localness also added in plan, because you knew how many workers you had, you knew what their capabilities were, and that gave you the ability to plan out effectively. Second, it was collected. <coughs> no person could get rich in the commune alone. If uh, the, the commune, the work point was determined by a calculation of all total amount of productivity, such that my family could not get rich without yours because we all had to benefit from work points. So it was a collective structure and a collective monitoring structure. Third, and for any of you who are Chinese in the room, you will notice the importance of this being public. This was posted on the door. How many uh, points uh, Professor Womack made versus me would be a public piece of information. And in Professor Li Huayin's book, he has great stories about how, uh, he says, the old ladies of the village, every morning that there was posted, they'd get up and they'd just make sure that gong fur are correct. They were obsessed with making sure that their family made what they deserved and that others' families were not making more than them. So there was an effort to concentrate people on the relative allotment of work points compared to others to create competition and to create shame. Have you guys ever heard of the term moyangong? A moyangong is a lazy person. It's a person who isn't doing their job. And in the data I had, I actually had a category of this person, lazy people. How many lazy people? And so the idea of being a moyangong was deeply shameful and because nobody could leave, nobody wanted to be labeled as one. So 
So this idea of being public and being collective is actually putting massive pressure. You know, when, when uh, we talk about incentives, what bigger incentive is there than that? And then, as I mentioned before, extraction was ex ante, meaning that the total productivity was done, the, the collective would take its share, and the remaining share would then be divided according to work points by family and household. So this extraction came beforehand. The people themselves, in all of the interviews, I rarely found anybody who knew total productivity of their commune. They, they knew how many work points they made. They know how many work points their neighbors made. But what they didn't seem to know very much was the total productivity of the entire institution. And that was intentional. The goal was to focus people as much as possible on their slice of the pie so that they would work harder, not to focus them on the total productivity. And after 1971, they were flexible. This is really important. You had to award work points, which how you awarded them was up to you after 1971. You could have time rates, uh, say babysitting, a certain amount of time. You could have piece rates, so you're, you're weaving baskets. You get a certain amount of work points for your basket. Or task rates, say plow a field. But how you awarded that was totally up to the locality and the local leaders. There was no uh, preference after 1971. The point was it had to be collective and it had to be work point related. Now, bear with me here for a second so I can explain how this, I think, worked in practice. I mean, I call commune kabuki. I call it kabuki. Are you guys familiar with kabuki theater? During kabuki theater, you have people in black masks who are the stagehands. They come in and they set things up, and you as the audience are not supposed to know this is happening. In many ways, the work point system operated in a similar fashion. The workers did not know how much their work points were worth. They struggled to acquire as many as possible. They paid close attention to how many they had relative to others. Meanwhile, no matter how many work points were awarded within, uh, or which remuneration system was used to award them, about half of total income was removed from the communal pot before the work points value was calculated, and the upshot of this then is that members were obsessed with their own work points. But leaders were generally agnostic about the total number of work points awarded as long as they could extract the resources necessary to fulfill their mandate, which was development. So as long as they could distribute enough that people weren't starving, fine. If people were starving, that was a problem, you then had to distribute more and you invest a little bit less. But as long as people were at subsistence and able to work hard, that was the essential part. But what about Maoism? You know, Maoism has been talked about oftentimes as a megalomaniac. Just this guy wants everyone to worship him. But it was much, much more than that. It was the essential collectivist ideology of the commune that enforced the idea that you, the individual, should sacrifice for the collective. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's similar to the religiosity of American communes, religious communes, except the guy they had in charge of Jesus, right? That was the collectivist idea. Here, you have Maoism as your collectivist ideology, which encourages people to sacrifice for the greater good. Unless you think that Maoism, as it has been portrayed, was completely agnostic as to development, I would say the opposite was true. Maoism is obsessed with development. And you could even see it on the pins that I purchased myself. Here you have Mao, and out of his great genius comes high modernist agricultural development. Uh, development of dams and even um, terracing. Here you have this perhaps the most important element of rural China's mechanization, the shofu tong uh, ji, or the, uh, the small handheld tractor. And here you have Mao, the bowl of food, and the gear, and the stalk of grain. What does the gear and the stalk of grain represent? Any thoughts? The worker-peasant alliance. The worker-peasant alliance. In many ways, what was going on here was trying to turn peasants into workers. And anybody who knows 1980s China knows that kind of work. Here you can also see that there was a whole set of songs and rituals associated with this. There, is a, there are pictures in my book of the Shakers, because a lot of their kind of dances, their collective routines, did mirror some things going on in the commune. You had uh, the competitions for reading Mao verses. You had efforts constantly. Every morning, you would have to wake up and greet Mao. Every night, you had to say goodbye to him. My mother-in-law can still recite the blessings that she had to give before every single meal, blessing Lin Biao and Mao Zedong. Right? There was a strong religiosity to this, and there was a lot of repetition. And, and, and the, anybody who's ever been in church or synagogue or mosque knows what it's like when you sing with people. Knows the collective feeling that comes when you sing and dance with people together and what that means. And that was part of Maoism. It was an essential part. Here you have the toughest part of every commune, which is passing down the collectivist ideology. And so that went on as well. 
passing down to the next generation of the ideology, and generally it worked. This is a picture I took in Jiangxi, rural Jiangxi, in 2011, and you can see Mao's image still up there, and as uh, Professor Womack said at the beginning, that was not an uncommon scene. Whenever I went to these places, I saw Mao's image. I did not see Deng's image. I imagine now I might see Xi's, I don't know, but the important bit is that Maoism was still a part of their life. Decades after Mao was gone, this ideology was still there. Now, I told you that 50% has been extracted. Now let me demonstrate it. Here you can see the Great Leap Forward, the mass extraction that took place that led to the famine. Then you can see the policies undertaken to increase consumption such that people could, again, begin to get the caloric intake they needed. But here in 1962, China introduces something called the Liu Shikao, or the 60 Articles. The 60 Articles became the, the fundamental document of China's communes from 1962 to 1983. And under the 60 Articles, you can see a gradual reduction in the amount of household consumption as a percentage, such that by the time Mao dies, your average household is again consuming 50% of total collective income. I would, I would suggest to you that is only possible if you increase productivity, because you've definitely increased population. So here you have 50%, and here you have 50%, except for here you have no starvation, and here you have a massive famine. The only way that's possible is through increased productivity. Now, we talked about what decollectivization meant in terms of uh, um, uh, administrative, but what about what it meant in terms of the lives of the average person? This is what it meant. It meant increased consumption. You can see the average household went from consuming at the time of decollectivization about 52, 53 percent, but by 1983 they were consuming over 70 percent of total collective income. So decollectivization was more consumption. And by the way, Deng Xiaoping said this again and again and again. The goal was to increase the amount of food that the peasants had available. And this won Deng Xiaoping a lot of support when he did it. Not surprisingly, he increased my uh, uh, income 20%, I'd like it too. Now, I'll get back to what that meant in a moment, but I want to talk about the why. The Agricultural Research and Extension System was a sub-institution nested within every single commune. At the team, brigade, county, and commune level, they had test plots and they had people who were experts in agricultural productivity and shared their knowledge and traveled around. One thing it's important is to look at is who this propaganda is speaking to. Here you have children led by an older peasant and a female cadre learning about how to uh, create a grain silo. Here you can see the high modernist agricultural modernization going on in the background. Here you have a small work group team and you can see there isn't anybody who's not represented. You have a little uh, you have little kids, you have old people, you've got everyone in the mix, and all of them working with this equipment to increase productivity. This was an all hands on deck approach. This was not a, I'll wait for the guy in the lab coat to give me my seeds. This was, I need to develop the seeds that work best in my locality. And that was something people were instructed, as you can see from the propaganda, to do. Here you can see, we're gonna do it on our own. And a young woman and young man with their seed varieties. All of these are from the mid 70s. Message was clear. Every locality was part of the development effort. Nobody could simply say, this is not for me. From the children to the oldest to the men to the women, everybody was hands on deck. There were also these commune and brigade enterprises, which became more and more important over time. Here you can see the, um, the duck farm, and here you can see basket weaving. But always politics, see? In agriculture, study the Dajai model, and the Dajai model was the Maoist model. So everywhere, you had Maoism. It was ubiquitous within the system. But these enterprises did not disappear. They became the town and village enterprises. And many people misunderstand. They think these town and village enterprises sprung up from nowhere. No. They were the privatized version of this. So all of this investment actually maintained and continued to be productive well after the commune was gone. And what was the effect of this? Well, as you can see, there was a massive investment in agriculture during this period. This period, I'm not sure I know what that even means, okay? Let me be frank with you. Great Leap Forward was a messy period, I'm not sure I know. But I can tell you that from here, 1969 and upwards, 
This conforms with everything that I've told and everything I'm about to show you. You can see the massive investment that went on, and you can also see that after 1979, you had a fall. Well, that's to be expected. You saw the increase in consumption. Well, for every increase in consumption, every piece of grain you eat is one you don't invest. There had to be a commiserate fall in investment. And this is the commiserate fall in investment. In fact, if I didn't see this, then I would scratch my head because, you know, there had to be a problem. You can see this in terms of machine cultivation of land. Rapid increases in the, six, in the 70s, followed after reform and opening up by a reduction. The agricultural transportation during this period also skyrocketed in terms of trucks, boats, vehicles, bicycles, it all went up. And these things are important because they transmit ideas, right? A bicycle in a commune is a very important thing if it carries ideas when the people who are riding it. Fertilizer use went up, but it's important to note that fertilizer in this period is very different than in this period. In the early period, it was basically um, poop <laughs> and, the, and the strategic use of it. Here at this point, this is uh, largely um, uh, was ammonia, very uh, uh, synthetic fertilizers, okay? So increasing fertilizer usage, but different types of fertilizer. This is really important, hybrid seed variety. 1965, less than 20% of China was using dwarf rice. By 1974-76, it was 80%. Yuan Longping comes along in 1974 and creates hybrid rice varieties. In 1976, they begin to be distributed. By 1983, 20% of Chinese farmers are using hybrid rice. And you can see this in terms of sorghum, maize, and others. These are the trends. And of course, this triumvirate is essential. You need their seeds, you need irrigation, and you need the, you know, the, the fertilizer. These three things, if you lack one of the triangle, your production dips considerably. So this was really important, and China was the only country to mass circulate hybrid rice varieties. Irrigation networks, again, look at the increase during the 1970s, look at the flat line during the 80s. This also had to do with capital, human capital. Here you have this increase in the number of teacher and technical training schools and students until about this point when you have flat lines. This, the primary, middle, and high school. So primary, middle, and high school, all more or less similar trends in terms of student enrollment. During reform and opening up, the amount of students in rural schools went down. There's really no way to uh, interpret this data, I think, any different. Now let's talk a bit about these three small freedoms that I teased out for you. First, the first was private plots. And these things I want to stress were protected under the 60 articles. They were law. It's not that they couldn't be infringed upon, but it wasn't riskless for a local official to violate national policy. I have never met a farmer in this period who told me they did not have to live. Every one of them has told me they have a private plot. It may have been adjacent to their house or it may have been elsewhere, but they all had a particular plot that they could use as they would. They were cottage enterprises, and you know, they're, and these things were limited in scale. So um, the, the in your shoes, they're called shiitian, the, the, the things you put in your shoes, these were very uh, popular. People would knit sweaters, uh, people would grow eggs. I mean, all measure of cottage enterprises were completely permissible as long as you didn't grow above a certain level. A certain amount of chickens, no problem. A certain amount of pigs, but no, a private person could not own a full pig farm. But then you need the rural free market. Because if you allow this, but you have no market mechanism, you end up with black markets. So you have to have a market mechanism to clear all of this. And that is where the rural free market comes in. And this was not a black market. This was something, as I'll show you in a minute, which was control. It was under the leadership of the institution itself. It was part of the commune. But why allow this at all? You know, isn't this a communist country? And many leftists at the time said that, you know, what the hell are we doing with this uh, uh, three small freedoms? People like Zhang Qing, they didn't like it. They said, this is the tale of capitalism. But why allow it? Well, first, you needed to put a consumption floor under your population, especially after the Great Leap Forward. After that famine, a lot of legitimacy was lost, and they needed to reassure the peasants that no matter what happens, you have your private plot. You will survive. This is a, not a small political decision. Second, there was, there's a variation in economies of scale. Um, if you want to grow grain, then a big field and collectivization is all to the good. If you want to grow raspberries, big fields don't do it. You need the hand 
You need somebody caring, right? And so when you allow for this variation, you're allowing for different economies of scale across of the rural economy, and this was essential to increasing productivity. It was also important to use leftover materials. I mean, you've got this collectivization, but there was always gonna be a little leftover fertilizer, a little leftover this and that. It, 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 you don't wanna throw it away, so you would then allow your households to use it on their plots and make sure that you didn't waste. It's, this was the cardinal sin in the common group. Was anything, you couldn't say anything bad about Mao, and you could not waste. If you wasted, ooh.